sure that anyone with any interest in in Chinese history in the last century has come across the terms Marxism-Leninism and Marxism-Leninism Mao Zedong thought. And if you're particularly new to the ideology or perhaps English isn't your first language, these terms can be incredibly confusing. And at first glance, one may assume, I mean rather understandably so, that Chairman Mao Zedong's contribution to Marxism-Leninism may be called Marxism-Leninism-Maoism. It's his next stage, isn't it? It's the first stage. Well, unfortunately for you, and for all of us, communists don't tend to like making things that simple. So, in this video, I shall try and clear up the difference between Marxism-Leninism Mao Zedong thought and Marxism-Leninism Maoism, as well as explain which ideology the MCP as a Maoist party adheres to. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Okay, so this video is going to be divided into seven main parts. Number one, the difference between the two terms. Number two, whether Mao Zedong thought is just a national application of Marxism-Leninism. Number three, whether it was Mao or Gonzalo who identified new, universally applicable contradictions. Number four, the MLM claim that Mao became revisionist in his later years. Number five, MLM being more socially liberal. Number six, being pretentious and, you know, the spirit of the Cultural Revolution. And finally, number seven, our party's own position and the usage of language. So to start off with, the difference between the two terms. The Maoist movement only actually split in the late 80s, in fact, where Abimael Guzman, or Gonzalo, in Peru, wished to make a distinction between Marxism-Leninism Mao Zedong thought and Marxism-Leninism Maoism. Marxism-Leninism Mao Zedong thought is an ideology that comes from China and was developed by Chairman Mao in the beginning of the Yan'an years, whereas Marxism-Leninism Maoism, as it's called, comes from Peru. So it's often argued by Gonzalo's supporters that Marxism-Leninism Mao Zedong thought is merely a Chinese application of the pre-existing Marxism-Leninism, and that Mao Zedong thought is simply deciding to hold a revolution with peasants or something like that. It's an application in a particular circumstance at the time. We will often compare the development to that of Marxism-Leninism, and claim that Marxism-Leninism was not synthesised until after Lenin's death, so Marxism-Leninism Maoism was also not synthesised in Mao's lifetime, but instead after his death. However, a core difference between these two is that there was no such thing as Lenin thought, and we definitely did not see references to uh, Marxism-Lenin thought as a second stage of Marxism, um, as, we, as we do with Marxism-Leninism Mao Zedong thought. The proponents of Marxism-Leninism Mao Zedong thought did not see their ideology as an application of Marxism-Leninism to China's peculiar circumstances, but indeed viewed it as a third and higher stage of development of the revolutionary science. Any cursory glance at Chinese media from this period makes this overwhelmingly evident. Take this quote, for example, from the foreword to the second edition of quotations from Chairman Mao. Mao Zedong Tong Shi Shi Dang Dai Zui Wei Da De Marcus Lenin Zui Zhe. Mao Zedong Tong Ji Tian Sai De Chuang Zhao Xing De Chuan Mian De Ji Cheng Han Wei He Fan Jia Le Marcus Lenin Zui. Ba Marcus Lenin Zui Ti Gao Dao Yi Ge Jiang Xing De Jie Duan. Which means in English, Comrade Mao Zedong is the greatest Marxist Leninist of our era. He has inherited, defended, and has developed Marxism-Leninism with genius, creatively, and comprehensively, and has brought it to a higher and completely new stage. Or you could look at this post, for example. Wei da de Marcus Lenin Jui Mao Zedong Su Xiang Wan Sui. Long live the great Marxism-Leninism Mao Zedong thought. So clearly, Mao Zedong thought was considered to be a new stage of development to Marxism-Leninism, 
and I think that it's, it's totally disingenuous to claim that it was only viewed as Marxism-Leninism applied to a different place, and that Gonzalo or someone had to come along and synthesise a new ideology. And the second part, whether it was Mao or Gonzalo who identified new universally applicable contradictions. I shall outline some of the new contradictions identified by Chairman Mao Zedong and explain why they are universally applicable. Even the supporters of Gonzalo agree that a new stage of Marxist science consists of new universally applicable contradictions. Therefore, if such contradictions are found within Mao Zedong thought, then we can indeed call it a new stage. So firstly, People's War. Now this is not only something which applies in agrarian societies such as China, there can indeed be such a thing as urban guerrilla warfare. It doesn't necessarily have to take place in the countryside, but just any sort of remoter areas where not a lot of people traverse and even things like abandoned buildings and the like can be used to this end. Organising people in the first world may be more difficult, of course, as many people are pacified and do have more to lose than just their chains. But this shouldn't be an excuse to do nothing and just wait for the revolution to arrive sitting in our armchairs, because if we do that, it never will. A good base of support can be established by winning the favour of the most impoverished in the community, most probably through charitable works, and once a connection is established, then bases can be built. They will know us by our love, you may say. Secondly, New Democracy. Now, originally this existed specifically for countries in the transition from feudalism. It is universally applicable for all feudal countries. The reason it cannot be applied everywhere is that there are barely any feudal countries existing today. However, a form of this theory could still be applicable for countries under colonial or partial colonial control, or even those with absolute monarchies. And the idea of it is to have a bourgeois, or what we call the new democratic revolution, and then the socialist one. The composition of a new democracy in, adap in different adaptations may look different in whichever particular country. It, it just may not look like the Chinese one necessarily. But many countries may still need it, and just because some countries don't meet the criteria doesn't prevent it from being universally applicable for those which do. Then, the mass line. And this, you can consider it as Mao's development to the vanguard which we saw in Marxism-Leninism, but it is more populist in its nature. It does not rely on a group of elites to guide the revolution, but gathers ideas from the masses and their proposed solutions may not always be what is, in the end, implemented, exactly anyway, but the important part is taking on board what their concerns are, and showing that you are addressing them in a concrete way. Also, it means that you know exactly what they care about, and as a result can produce targeted propaganda, slogans, etc. in the field, which are, most, which are tuned in to what they actually value, and this should strike a chord with them, and have a greater impact. This is a totally unique formulation of Chairman Mao, and when we look at the vanguard of the Soviet Union before, only a small group of people had the class consciousness. And the problem with this is that what can happen is that you get a contradiction that emerges um, actually between the masses themselves and then the vanguard, where the masses feel ignored and they experience resentment towards the vanguard. Listening to the people and validating their concerns provides them with assurance that they are involved with the process of change and that their thoughts are indeed being heard. Then well-educated, enthusiastic revolutionaries are sent in and amongst the people to teach them and, most importantly in fact, to learn from them. And then those revolutionaries help construct the party line to be in accordance with the needs of the people. And finally, the Cultural Revolution. Now, it's often assumed that the a cultural revolution of sorts occurred in all socialist countries at some point, just part and course of a revolution. This is actually not the case. The cultural revolution is more than simply making a new proletarian culture, although that is an important tool 
to be used in it. The idea of a cultural revolution is to remove the capitalist elements that remain in society's superstructure after the base has been changed. This is so that the capitalist remnants cannot try and utilise such features and practices to try and justify their economic practices once again and try to influence and ultimately reverse the changes in the revolution and to the base by trying to revert to a previous mode of production. Even after the overthrow of political power, the struggle between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat continues. Those former business owners do not simply disappear, and they badly want the life back that they had before. So they will hark back to specific cultural practices that they themselves had instituted when they had control over the culture. There is a distinct difference between having a socialist economy and having a socialist society, and if the latter fails to be accounted for, or isn't even considered, then the former too shall collapse. What's important as well to bear in mind is this does not um, necessitate a destruction of all that is old, an error made by some fanatics in fact. Things like, I don't know, respect for your elders, calligraphy and painting, going to mass, practicing martial arts, etc etc, have absolutely nothing to do with reinforcing the former mode of production. The idea of the Cultural Revolution is not to be a crusade against all that is old just because it's old, but a targeted assault against particularly corrosive aspects. It is important to, for people to have a sense of identity and heritage, and if you wipe out all of the old culture, then you have nothing to identify with. Indeed, actually, if we look back to the example of China, we saw the combination of ancient heritage and the communist message using old Chinese proverbs, Mao did that all the time. Architectural styles imitating old Chinese architectural styles, architectural styles borrowed from the Soviet Union, heck even putting Mao's face on Tiananmen and using the Tiananmen gate on all, all artwork and these sorts of things. Um, calligraphy, uh, all these sorts of things were used but to a revolutionary end. The culture that was produced was still distinctly Chinese but now it belonged to the people the, the working class instead of um, the bourgeois class and they use that to make their own superstructure which reinforces the new base. Once this is achieved and the gap between economy and society is closed up, the true end of the Cultural Revolution is realised and that's ultimately to challenge the party. Learning from the errors of the Soviet Union, Mao saw that their intense focus on a mode of production which was by all means to be expected in the first ever so um, socialist experiment, of course. Um, but this meant that they lacked a focus on society somewhat, or at least neglected it to a certain degree that it began to cause problems. This eventually led to a culture that was not congruent with the USSR's economic goals, and this is especially exemplified in the years following Stalin's death. Even though the Soviet Union made new art and films, and songs, etc, etc, it lacked a second part of the Cultural Revolution, which was to have a systematic way to destroy the corrupt thoughts and tendencies left over from the previous society. This is precisely how people like Khrushchev were even able to rise to power in the first instance. The Great Purge in the 1930s is perhaps the closest that the USSR ever got to a Cultural Revolution, and it did indeed deal with opportuni opportunists in the party, but this was not practising what Mao would later set forth, as its means were different. Not only was it a singular event, but it was carried out by the party itself, rather than the people. Whereas in China, it was the people criticising the party's actions, the party's factions, these sorts of things. But in the Soviet Union there were no regards from the people, uh, or any, any equivalent to call out corruption, or to safeguard the purity of communist thinking and practice. It was all done by secret police, by the government, by the party, and not by the masses like Mao would advocate. So I really, I, th I think it's not actually comparable. And this is actually a matter that Mao considered in formulating the theory of the Cultural Revolution. And although he praised the Soviet Union in a great many things, and especially in pioneering the first ever socialist state in the massive achievement that that was. He did want to continue to learn from them and from their mistakes, and this is all part 
of a scientific process. And he did think that there was actually a better way to deal with corruption and the like than they had done. Mao said, Stalin's work should be seriously studied to see what is correct and what is not. Stalin emphasised only technology, technical cadres. He wanted nothing but technology, no politics, no masses. Stalin speaks only of production relations, not of the superstructure, nor of a relationship between it and the economic base. Stalin mentions economics only, not politics and not the masses. And that's taken from On the Historical Experience of the Dictatorship of the Proletariat and Concerning the Economic Problems of Socialism in the USSR. Thus, I think we can safely say that the Cultural Revolution is a new theory of Mao Zedong, not just something that has been done in every socialist country that comes about. Moreover, it is definitely going to be universally applicable and will be suitable for a great many countries as every single country will need it in establishing socialism, which the majority of the world is still yet to do. Now Mao made more contributions than these that I've just set out here, such as Great Harmony, Unity of Opposites, Ruling Virtue, etc etc, but the ones I highlighted here particularly um, were because they are the main components in MLM as well. However, if all of these ideas were clearly already formulated in Mao's works, and were always understood as parts of Mao Zedong thought, which they were, for example, all of these aspects had their own subsection, in quotations from Chairman Mao. So it's hardly like they needed extracting and pulling together at a later date or anything like that. This does beg the question though, of what exactly Gonzalo's contribution actually is. I mean, you could have gone and asked a Chinese man in the 60s, and he would happily explain these concepts to you with great clarity and detail. And if you asked him what this ideology is, and who created it, he would tell you that it is Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thoughts, formulated by Chairman Mao. So then, what is the work of Gonzalo? He does not have to do what Stalin did, and gather together Mao's thoughts and synthesise them, for that has already been done by Mao himself. Um, Mao is analogous to both Lenin and Stalin. Because Gonzalo claims the Stalin role in this um, example, he doesn't present any new universally applicable contradictions of his own, which is fine for Stalin because he actually is gathering Lenin's ideas together, but Mao already gathered these ideas together. Mao has already completed what Stalin did in the case of Lenin, making his thinking actually more than just thought but into a new coherent stage, so Gonzalo is not needed to do that. At the very best, all that Gonzalo is actually doing is echoing some of the things that Mao has already said, and then claiming that he's synthesised it into a new ideology somehow. If anything at all, it seems like it is Gonzalo simply applying Mao Zedong thoughts or particular aspects of it to his own situation, as opposed to contributing anything new. And even if he claims that um, it working in Peru now proves the universality of Marxism, Leninism, and Mao Zedong thought, such a claim of un universality was already contained within the ideology since its inception, as it declared itself to be a new stage of Marxism, Leninism, which we know from before, necessitates it being universal. So Gonzalo successfully, well, depending on who you ask, successfully applied what Mao had previously laid out. How exactly does this count as founding a new ideology? Now we'll talk about the MLL claim that Mao became revisionist in his later years. It's often claimed by the advocates of MLM that it is necessary to create a new ideology apart from Mao's own thoughts because it was tainted by Mao's supposed revisionist turn in later life, and such individuals chiefly point towards the Three Worlds Theory. Now the Three Worlds Theory observed the situation in Mao's day, and sorted the nations in the world into three groups. The nations in such groups may change over time, however until global socialism is established, the groups themselves will exist in some form or another. The first group is world superpowers, 
which are the main perpetrators of imperialism and social imperialism. In Mao's era, this was the US and the Khrushchevite Soviet Union, and the latter was becoming more and more likely to start a new world war. The third world consists of people in Asia, Africa and Latin America, and is the main anti-imperialist force. The second world consisted of um, secondary imperialist powers of Europe, uh, as well as Canada, Australia and Japan, which can be the allies of the third world in the struggle against hegemony. This theory is mostly focused on safeguarding the sovereignty uh, of China against a mounting Soviet threat on the border. In the later years, you often saw um, China acting more and more out of step with Soviet states. After they had bravely, um, not, they didn't just fall along like many countries, but they bravely took a stand and denounced Khrushchevite revisionism, a rift between the China and the USSR emerged. So they had to become extremely pragmatic in foreign policy. Thus, they'd often accept less ideologically aligned states um, that would accept their own legitimacy as the true China and such, and were more suspicious of perhaps more ideologically aligned but Soviet allied states. It was an unfortunate situation, but it became simply a matter of survival, so that they could grow socialism within their own country still. This was stretched to an extreme in the Deng era, and lost sight of the original goal. Under the policy of reform and opening up, China became the best friends of the USA, one of the very things that Mao had originally, in fact, criticised the Soviet Union for under Khrushchev at the start of the issue. Many, many socialist countries fell to capitalism after the USSR was no longer there to support it. Mao had resisted this as the USSR, well, it was essentially dead to them because there was again no support. But unfortunately, Deng went the way of all those other countries too. The way you can tell though that Mao was no revisionist is that internally, socialism was never compromised. Yeah, Mao may have shook Nixon's hand, but that had no effect on the daily life of a Chinese man. It didn't change the relations to production. It didn't change the political situation at all. The culture wasn't becoming any more Americanized like under Deng, and the economy wasn't changing. But it was it was doing the good thing of preventing China from a potential war. Moves like this, Chairman Mao had to do, not because he enjoyed them particularly, but because it gave him the space and the freedom to do what he wanted in his own borders. Now this is a brief point, but I just want to mention a slight diversion, and this is that MLM is generally more socially liberal, or at least its followers, I don't know, I don't necessarily know that this is actually in what Gonzalo said himself, but the advocates of MLM are often found to be advancing all the causes of contraception, abortion, homosexual um, marriage, and transgenderism. And this makes a serious rupture from the ideas and practice of Chairman Mao. We can go into that in another video, but there's plenty to support that. So supporting such things under the name of Maoism, it really does impose something onto Mao that was never there. One of the things that the supporters of MLM take great pride in achieving is the arranging of a first gay marriage in the Philippines, which was organised by the MLM organisation New People's Army, and was undertaken by a secular priest, whatever one of those may be. <laughs> and they, they, they also espouse that, that people outside of minority groups cannot have direct control or say or instruct people of that minority, as they, as they have never experienced that struggle. Now to me that just sounds like a way of trying to get at centralised leadership or, or commands. I, I, I don't see where the problem is here. I mean, a, a male gynaecologist mo mo most likely knows far more about the female body than the average woman. It is true that Chairman Mao said no investigation, no right to speak, but I'm sure people from outside a group can do even more investigation inside of, of those inside a group than those inside a group even know about themselves. And what about history? Historians have never experienced the historical events if they're decently long ago, but I'm sure that these people with PhDs, provided they're not filthy Western historians, are more than qualified to speak on these topics that they've never directly experienced. I, I really don't understand that point there. 
but some of these people, they, they even go as far as to say that only what are only groups that are classed as oppressed minorities can even be Maoists. MLM also heavily involves itself with identity politics, focusing on oppressed identities and beyond and prioritising those above economic and class relations. And it promotes an idea of power struggles between identities like race and sex, etc. And that ruling identities have privilege which allows them to oppress non-privileged identities. None of this is part of Mao Zedong thought. Identity politics in particular is extremely dangerous as the hyper focus on identities means a white worker, a black worker and a woman worker can't stand together as workers anymore but are now divided into competing groups. You see why the bourgeoisie absolutely love this. These groups are never defined in terms of economics Oh, heaven forbid that. <laughs> it, so what it, what we essentially see is an application of Marx-like sounding rhetoric, but to non-economic identities. And it seems like justice is being done, but nothing concrete has ever been um, changed. The base of society has never been challenged. And by changing the way you speak, or, or you know, getting more representation of a particular identity, you, you are not changing the relations to production and you are not challenging the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie would be happy to have a black person on their board rather than stop exploiting workers, it's as, it's as simple as that. So as such, it is theoretically flawed and inadequate for explaining injustices in society which at their roots are all economic. In this way, they have won over much of the left, including supporters of MLM, who think things like campaigning for so-called abortion reproductive rights, even though there's nothing reproductive about abortion, or some sort of change in dialogue, some change in how you say pronouns is some sort of revolutionary action. They're thinking the vanguard of a revolution or valiant revolutionaries for doing things like this, but not changing the economics, which is extremely, extremely, profoundly idealistic. If we want to defeat capitalism, we are going to need a party that will organize working people to fight for the demands that we want and to win socialism. Thank you so much. Great. Right uh, quick point of privilege. Quick uh, point of personal privilege. Yes. Um, guys, uh, first of all, James Jackson, Sacramento, he, him. I just want to say, can we please keep the chatter to a minimum? I'm one of the people who's very, very prone to sensory overload. There's a lot of whispering and chatter going on. It's making it very difficult for me to focus. Please, can we just, I know it's, we're all fresh and ready to go, but can we please just keep the chatter to a minimum? It's affecting my ability to focus. Thank you. Thank you, comrade. Okay, is there a speaker against name, point chapter, pronoun? Privilege. Point of personal privilege. Yes. Please do not use gendered language to, to address everyone. And finally, I just want to talk about a phenomenon I see quite a lot, and this isn't this doesn't apply to everyone, but it's all too common, and it's sort of be being pretentious and how we reconcile that with the spirit of the Cultural Revolution. So an interesting point, and in which, again, I'm, I'm sure it probably doesn't apply to every adherent of the ideology, but with many, many videos I've seen, and a great deal of interactions I've had with people, they just... I don't know how to put it, it just seems so stuck up, and I honestly have no idea why. I'm sure always around them to use the term MZT, so unless they blast me for calling myself a Maoist. I mean, it's such an attitude, such a hyper-focus on semantics, really the spirit of Chairman Mao, or of the Cultural Revolution? Would this man here recognise such individuals as his comrades? We 1919 
工农受苦人统治那些大党阀，把他们赶下来，让人民直接掌握政权的共产主义革命。毛主席永远在革命，我们应该继承毛主席的仪式，将革命进行到底。将无产阶级文化大革命进行到底，不要半途而废，实现马克思共产党学员提出的实现共产主义革命，消灭资本家的私有财产，把这钱分给全中国、全世界人民。一是谁创造了人类世界？是我们劳动群众。一切归于劳动者所有，那人容纳，即生头。这是最后的斗争，团结起来，到明天，共产主义就一定要实现。就说这些吧，好吧，嗯、啊，啊，有多少家庭？The thing is, these sorts of people, who always call us LARPers, rather ironically, always seem to be the sort of armchair communist type. I like to think that at least what we are trying to do is something, yeah, it's something. We want to spread education and the like. I mean, at our present size and scattered so far across the world, what exactly do they expect us to do? Try and lead a revolution with about 40 people scattered across the globe? It'd be totally idealistic to think at such numbers there'd be any chance of victory. First, education must occur. We must build up bases of supporting communities through charitable work, serving the people. This is how Mao built up his, his support in the peasants, by doing meaningful things for them, and his actions spoke louder than all of his words. I think that people can sometimes fall into a trap of just spending so much time obsessing over names and terminology and failing ever to get stuck in and talk about the actual concepts. I honestly have absolutely no clue why this toxicity, which rivals the supporters of Pol Pot, is such a problem amongst the supporters of, of Gonzalo. I mean, I, I really see nothing in the ideology itself which makes it this way. But it is very much, um, it just makes me not want to associate with him. And that's very sad, especially because I want to call um, these people comrades, but quite clearly they don't want to do the same um, for me. I mean, some of these people, they just get so so triggered because we call um, Mao Zedong Fort Maoist. Really, uh, it's just for ease. I mean, even if it's not your beloved Gonzaloist Maoism, as some people in our party would call it, if he made the development that good, Maybe I think he should stick his name on it himself. But it's not like Gonzalo's edition or any of the things, especially socially, that have been shoehorned into the ideology of MLM, under the name of it, is intrinsic to Mao's thoughts, which is why I think the ideology should just be called Gonzaloism or something like that, because such practices can't be retroactively inserted into Mao. The online communist community in the first world is so toxic. Things are better on the ground at least, but um, because you're forced to a greater extent, I think, to view your comrade as another person. The MCP at least um, exists as somewhat of a haven from all this nonsense and craziness. But these people, they just seem more bothered about fighting their own comrades over names and terminology and, and saying who does or who doesn't have a right to use a certain word. It seems as though they live to tear other communists down, which it just seems extremely petty. People really are just so patronising and terribly un unwelcoming to other comrades. I have met some such Maoists and tried to interact with them, and their snobbishness just, le it just leaves a bad taste in one's mouth and it makes, it makes you just not want to have anything to do with them. I mean, good goodness, I, if, if I had to frequently deal with people like that, who's supposedly on my side. I'd rather just recruit someone from scratch, maybe on the right, who's reasonable at least, um, instead of going through all that toxicity. I mean, you may have your most pure master race strain of MLM, but I, I'm not being funny, but if I was sat on an armchair throne 
<laughs> on a pile of fast food boxes and empty cans of coke. I don't exactly think I'd feel accomplished spending all my time calling people out over the internet or spamming LARP and Paul Gonzalo on comment section all over YouTube. I mean, even if it's just a free time thing, um, I, I think I'd rather just spend it playing Minecraft with my, my comrades in the MCP. And just tearing people down like this, people who are your own comrades, even if you disagree with them, use it as a chance to engage in discussion, um, try and explain your views. What's really achieved by proclaiming your own intellectual prowess and superiority? I, I only think further division, and I think the bourgeoisie take great delight in seeing that on the left. Are such individuals really trying to get comrades together and help? Or are they just there to flaunt their own theoretical supremacy and talk down to others? When you speak with people who participated in the Cultural Revolution, as I was fortunate enough two years to have done so in, when I went to China, and you see the spirit of that generation, I, I've got to say, their culture is just nothing like the culture of these Maoists. The real spirit of the Cultural Revolution is all about the group's good, and it draws attention away from the self, and it is all about the advancement of the collective. The spirit of the Gonzaloists is often an individualistic one which seeks only to prove one's own superiority and genius. Plus, the bourgeoisie adore wars of words because it avoids concrete change, and it is idealistic folly of changing the dialogue or, or whatever kind of nonsense. Understand that I am by no means asserting this is the behaviour of all supporters of MLM or people involved in it. This could very well be an abrasive vocal minority, but my MLM comrades, I must say, and um, take this from an outsider's perspective looking in, this is this is how you are presenting yourselves. And it's just, it isn't an inviting or welcoming or cooperative demeanor at all. It just wants me to, it just makes me want to leave it alone and not interact with you guys, which is, I'm, I'm very sorry to say that. All this does make you wonder, why did the Chinese comrades in the first place use the term Marxism, Leninism, and Mao Zedong thought at all? I mean, perhaps Mao was a bit too humble um, to add himself onto Marx and Lenin. A bit like how Lenin wasn't also into laughter, but we talked about how that's different as well. Maybe if there was no Gonzalo after him, we would call Mao's ideology Marxism, Leninism, and Maoism. But alas, we should refrain from doing that because it's going to cause confusion. With MLM, it almost seems like the name that we should have in a, in a certain sense, and it makes things very confusing indeed. It's not helpful at all to a beginner. Um, however, at the end of the day, it is a matter of semantics, and we just need to define our terms and be clear on that we follow the theory and practice of Mao. We still use the term Maoist for ease, because Maoist Communist Party, or Mao Zhui Gongchenlao, is much short, short of a Mao, Mao Zedong Fort Communist Party, or Mao Zedong Sushan Gong Chang Dao, it's just too long. So, it's, it's similar to how you'd say Maoist China, but I specifically refrain from using the phrase MLM to describe our ideology. Really, we just need to agree with terms and get on with it. It frustrates me to no end that some of these pretentious armchair communists, many of whom claim to be Maoists, just want to tear other communists down and in all they're achieving is dividing the proletariat in arguments over words and semantics, whilst never actually discussing material reality. If you ask me, it's profoundly idealistic. It's why when debating, you have to ag agree the terms um, first, so then you can actually discuss the objective matters at hand. We have no need for a semantic high horse. We use words as the people use them. And I think that's more than enough for this video, comrades. Um, please, if you are a follower of MLM, I don't mean any harsh... I don't have any harsh feelings towards you at all. I'd be more than happy to be your comrade. I just... I, I just really don't see the need... Need for the ideology as such, and... I don't really see how it's Maoism, because... Um, just what I've said here, I, I, th I think Mao had already made enough of an ideology back in his day to be able to be called um, a, f a further stage of revolutionary science. I don't think Gonzalo needed to make that, and if he did, 
want to synthesize new ideology. Maybe it should have his name or not Mao's. That's all I think. So, um, thank you very much for listening. If you've got all the way through here, <laughs> and um, ho- hopefully, I can. S- well, I can see this being an extremely controversial video. I can all see the comments flooding in now. Hopefully, if we make some um, song videos and and Maoist Minecraft and all that sort of thing, it can be, it can be a bit less, um, a bit less controversial, a, a bit a bit less triggering. <laughs> Um, but alas, this needs to be done, and it's something that we ought to address for a long time, and we can just send it to people when it's needed, so, that's it for now, comrades, um, may God bless you, may Mary intercede for you, and never forget what Chairman Mao said, serve the people. Alright, have a good one. Oh,